there's any doubt in your mind that the Holy Spirit works mightily in this church, the sermon that came to me yesterday was not the sermon that I thought earlier in the week I would be preaching. And it's amazing how the songs that we just sang go right along with it. Back in 1977, a Steven Spielberg movie was released that caught the attention of the world. And that movie was entitled Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And it sparked a whole interest throughout the world about UFOs and aliens and pilots being abducted from jet planes and little boys being abducted from their backyard and space travel and all that kind of thing. But this morning, we're going to continue moving forward in the epiphany season, and we're going to look at another kind of close encounter, our encounter with God's presence and his purpose for our lives. The wonderful thing about this close encounter that I'm going to talk about this morning is that it's not science fiction. It's more like a reality series. You know, Epiphany, as I said last week, is the time in our church year where we closely examine who God is to us and how he was made present in our lives in light of the Christmas season. <coughs> These few short weeks that we have invite us to develop a new or expanding sense of God's true presence in our lives and what that means for each and every one of us as we lead our lives up towards the Lenten and Easter season. The heart of Epiphany, or the revelation of God to us, is in the relationship that God wants to share with each of us. The first part of any relationship, as we discovered last week, when we looked at Isaiah's prophecy, was that a meeting takes place. Do you remember seeing the love of your life for the first time? And your heart kind of skipped the beat there. When it happened, we made a determined effort to meet that person, didn't we? Made a determined effort to really get to know them. Isaiah told us last week to arise and shine for our light has come. <clears throat> It's that sort of promise that we've heard all the time that we've heard someone say to us, just wait, there's someone out there especially for you. And once we meet that person, we begin the dating dance. We enter that time of getting to know that person, learning all about them, but you know, that's not only true in our relationship that we share with a life mate. It's also true in all of our relationships. Like when we enter a new workplace, we immediately begin the dance of determining whose personalities we jive with, who do we like, who do we not particularly care for, <laughs> whose interests are similar to ours. And then when we meet potential friends, we try to discover what it is we have in common with each other. When we go to a new church, or a new school, or even a new doctor's office, immediately we begin to calculate how comfortable do I feel? Do I feel like I can establish a relationship here? Why do we do this? I think we do it because we're testing the waters of new and potential relationships. In our scripture lesson for today, we discover an encounter of the closest kind with God. And this is the God who affirms our human worth, which is the first step in building a meaningful relationship. If you don't think anyone is worth anything, you don't waste your time trying to build a relationship with that person, do you? Today our scripture invites us to celebrate the assurance that we have a very valuable identity with the one who knows more about us than anyone possibly could know. 
the one who knows more about us than our partner, the one who knows more about us than our brothers or sisters or mothers or dads or any of our friends. Listen to what the psalmist David writes in Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm afar away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape the presence of your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was ever born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them, for they outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. The passage that I just read from Psalms details an intimate conversation with God in which David is the speaker and God is the listener. And the speaker, David, focuses very quickly on the word no. And that focus on the word no points to our relationship with God not simply being recognized, not simply being acknowledged, but being inseparably entwined and belonging to God. God is experienced as a holy intimate as well as all-knowing presence in our lives. In other words, David had such an encounter with the living God that he recognizes the relationship that they share. God knows David. Oh, how he knows David. We're told that David was a man after God's own heart. But a quick study of David's life shows us that he had some real high points, some great times in which God was there with him, and that he really wanted God to know about, and God knew about, and all the great things that were happening in his life. We all remember the stories from our Sunday school, David and Goliath, and dancing before the ark as it came into Jerusalem, and all the wonderful things that David did. But you know, the stories they don't tell us in Sunday school is when David was standing on the balcony looking at Bathsheba taking her bath. 
David had a lot of things in his life that he was ashamed of. David had sinned greatly. But he didn't want God to know all about that. He had had a man murdered. He didn't want God to know about that. But he still lifted this psalm up to God. I think a lot of us could say that we're a lot more like David than we would care to admit. We're so glad when God's looking down on us as perfect little angels doing all the right things, saying all the right things, being all the right places, reaching out and touching others with compassion. But just like David, we have to recognize that God knows us just as much when we're ashamed of what we've done. When we've said those words that we can't take back. When we've hurt someone that we feel like it's beyond repair. All those little hidden things in our lives that we might hide from other people, we can't hide from God. God knows us, just like he knew David. According to Psalm 139, God knows everything about us. Not some things, not just the good things. He knows everything about us. He knows when we sit down. He knows when we stand up. He knows when we're on the right path. He knows when we're on the wrong path. He knows our thoughts. He knows our ways. He knows what we have said. He knows what we're saying now and what we're getting ready to say. There's nothing that God doesn't know about you and me. There's nothing that we can hide from God. amazing thing is God knows that. He knows all there is to know about us and he still wants to have a relationship with us. Warts and all. When you think about it and you think about where you find love and care where do you find it? It's always in the context of a relationship, isn't it? But before creation, God has planned to be in relationship with his creation. That is part of the master plan. That God would be in fellowship and relationship with each and every one of us. He has desired fellowship with every single human being that has ever walked or will walk the face of this earth. You remember when Adam and Eve had eaten from the forbidden tree. And they were walking in the garden and they heard the Lord coming, walking towards them in the cool of the day, calling their name. First we have to ask ourselves, why was the Lord walking in the garden? It's because he wanted fellowship with Adam and Eve. He wanted to fellowship with his creation. <coughs> But they had sinned, so they hid. Even though sin separated them from God and from God's perfect creation, He did not abandon them. He did not destroy them. He didn't take out the big eraser and take it all away and say, let me start over and do something <coughs> different this time. <coughs> Yes, he did punish them, but he did not abandon them. And he continued to fellowship with them. Claiming the New Testament promise that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow leads us to understand that when nobody else notices us, that when nobody else seems to care about us, that when nobody else has time to bother with us, God is still out there searching for us. Mm -hmm. We are all endlessly interesting to God. Now, I don't think I'm a very interesting person. I can be downright boring, actually. But there's something in my heart 